It is something in a sport that is played all over the world to be the most expensive player in that sport. The player that a club is willing to spend more money on than any other club has ever spent on any other player ever. Only a few players have ever held this title, and Gianluigi Lentini is one of those players. And for the few that know his story, it is considered a tragedy. But is it just a tragedy to us? A player who himself seems happy with how his career turned out, but whose talent was so short-lived, so abruptly and savagely robbed from us by one decision that we can't help but want more to wonder what could have been. He was, for a brief moment, a star that guided an unlikely club to being one of Europe's best teams, if just for a moment. And then he receded back into the Italian countryside from whence he came. Carmagnola, more specifically, a small town of 28,000 people, about 35 minutes south of Turin, if you're driving these days on the E717. Anyways, Turin obviously is known for football, but they're known for football because of Juventus, who's been around the top of Serie A for decades. That's not where Lentini would play, though. He started at Torino. Now Torino is the little brother, but in the early days of Italian football, Torino were the big bad bullies on the block before they suffered a Busby Babe-like air disaster in 1949 that wiped out their entire team. And after his youth career in a loan to Ancona, Lentini cemented himself in the Torino team in 1989, which was a season that would produce a bounce back promotion returning to Serie A. At 20 years old, the winger's star was rising as this unbridled, uncontrollable talent. But it was three matches into his first season in Serie A that everybody would be put on notice. It was a road trip to Inter Milan, who had just signed the German trio Mathaus, Klinsmann, and Brema, who had all just won the World Cup in Rome in 1990. Gigi Lentini, on the other hand, was set for just his third match in Serie A in his entire career career. He was raw, wild, and free, and he ran all over Inter Milan. The 21-year-old's power, balance, and audacity was unleashed by his head coach Emiliano Mondonico, and it was unleashed on Andreas Brema. The defender the BBC called peerless conceded a 40-meter run to Lentini that amounted to a humiliation and a goal, where apparently he looked almost concussed with how ragged he'd been run. As Herbie Sykes put it, Maybe Brema wasn't as good as everyone thought, or maybe Lentini was better than anyone dared hope. It was Gareth Bale against Inter in 2010, Messi beating Real Madrid 5-0. This was Wilshire tying prime Barcelona in a knot. Unfortunately for Lentini, it was Wilshire's trajectory that he would soon be following. Lentini's Torino stormed back into Serie A when Inter, AC Milan, and Juventus were stocked with the world's best players. They won the Turin Derby for the first time in seven years and booked a place in Europe when Juventus missed out on European play entirely. But it would be the following season where the world was treated to the fleeting sight of Gigi Lentini at his absolute best. Mercurial club owner Gianmaro Borsano spent money that he didn't have on Enzo Sifo and Walter Casagrande to bolster a team that had already surprised the league with a fifth place finish. Torino responded in this following season with the highest league finish that it's had since 1985, and that is still true to this day. AC Milan had an unbeaten season while being banned from Europe and won Serie A, but Torino finished third, led by the untamed Italian stallion Gigi Lentini. He played in 33 of the 34 Serie A games, the playmaking talisman out on either wing. But it was the UEFA Cup, the predecessor to the Europa League, where Gigi Lentini did his absolute best. A semi-final draw put Torino up against none other than Real Madrid, and the away leg produced a very valuable away goal in a 2-1 defeat. Back in the Stadio della Alpi, in front of 69,000 fans, a sellout crowd in the return leg, it was Lentini his long hair flapping in the wind, and his unbridled talent on full display, who whipped a vicious cross towards the back post that Ricardo Rocha had to play and played into his own net. That made it 2-2, and that was enough to go through on away goals, but it wasn't enough for Lentini. He was often most dangerous on the counterattack when his ability to run was unrestrained by tactical burdens, and he caught Madrid forward, then dispatched of Chindo on the skip before delivering a back post cross that was turned in for a second goal. Touched home by Luca Fusi, see it touched off a frenzy in the stands and Torino was headed to a European final. It was one that they would lose very cruelly after hitting the post three times in the second leg in Amsterdam. But it was Lentini who produced a wonderful assist in the first leg, which was a 2-2 draw at the Stadio della Alpi. You know, maybe if they'd subscribed to this channel, they would have won. Shame they weren't on YouTube back in 19... 
92. It's the moment Lentini would call the greatest regret of his entire career. And it's the moment everybody else would regret too, because it was the last time you'd be able to enjoy the full talent of Gigi Lentini without that twinge of apprehension. Because that summer, the arms race in Italy claimed its next victim. Borsano, who was spending money he didn't have as the chairman of Torino, needed to get some money back. And he happened to be sitting on a superstar who had just cracked into the Italian team, Lentini. As great as Lentini was, he was never perfect. He had a swashbuckling style. He was brilliant one moment, then awful or absent the next. He didn't fit into the rigid tactical discipline style that dominated the Italy of the day. But as the local hero of Torino, his downside was overlooked for what he could do and what he already had done. And as a result, all of Italy saw the same thing. A winger who at his best could trash anybody in the world. And this combined perfectly with the right climate to produce a record-breaking transfer because the arms race, even though it had dumped Borsano was still going on. And the two that were hovering around Lentini, Juventus and AC Milan. Now the BBC insists the Juventus transfer would have been impossible. Juventus a few years earlier tried to sign another player from Torino, but riots broke out in the streets and they had to announce that it was going to be canceled. Now these football times speculates that Juventus was just involved to drive up the price for their rival AC Milan. If so, it worked. And this summer wasn't even just about Gigi Lentini. Earlier in the summer, AC Milan had already broken the transfer record. They bought Jean-Pierre Papin from Marseille for 10 million pounds. Not to be outdone, Juventus later in the summer bought Gianluca Vialli from Sampdoria for 12 million pounds. Lentini would be the third time the transfer record was broken in just one summer by these two dueling clubs. It was a climant and a final move that these football times described as an act of one-upsmanship and vanity. Now Lentini was brilliant, but he had been at such a high level for such a brief time that it wasn't sure that the unique circumstances that happened at Torino would translate if he moved to another bigger club. But to AC Milan owner Silvio Berlusconi, it didn't matter, at least not enough. He was the prize of the whole market and Torino was desperate to sell. As Herbie Sykes of the BBC puts it, he whisked Lentini off to his villa in a helicopter. It made him feel like his friend. He then informed the player he was being sold, whether he liked it or not, due to an in-principle agreement he had signed with Borsano the previous year. The deal was 13 million pounds, 14 million euros. At the time, a truly offensive amount of money to be spent on one footballer. It also produced a 10 million euro contract for the boy from Carmagnola. Now, Gianmaro Borsano, who facilitated the sale to save his own skin and didn't cover himself in glory really at any point in this entire story, then tried to blame Lentini, saying that he forced his way out of the club, but it quickly flipped back on Borsano because he sold a couple of other key players and the Torino fans actually threatened his life at certain points and he had to go into hiding. He was eventually arrested for financial impropriety. But Borsano's initial accusation hung over Lentini, that he was out for the money, and it was bolstered by the fact that even the Vatican had said that the transfer fee was an offense to the dignity of work. That's how troubled people were about a 13 million pound transfer. The swell of hate was not dissimilar to Neymar's move to PSG. It was this realignment in one summer of what was possible financially and into that stepped Lentini, the boy from the countryside who'd never left home and had always really been able to do what he pleased. But the truth is he played pretty well in his first season at AC Milan. He played almost every game. They won Serie A. They got all the way to the Champions League final, but he didn't play I'm the most expensive player in the world well. And to double the issue, his interest in nightlife was beginning to dominate the tabloids. Or as Herbie Sykes once again so eloquently puts it, he was a young guy from Carmagnola who had become insanely rich in an instant and liked doing the sort of things that young guys from Carmagnola liked to do. But all of that good-natured partying became rather insane the summer following his first season in AC Milan. He became involved in a Wanda Morrow Icardi level scandal because he started dating the wife of the striker for AC Milan. Salvatore Toto Scalacci's wife. Now this is a guy that won the golden boot at Italia 90. And this was like an open thing because Scalacci's wife was trying to get back at him for taking on other women. It was very Icardi-esque, honestly. But during the preseason for the 93-94 campaign, Lentini left after a match to try and go to Turin to hang out with Toto's wife. And on the drive over to Turin, his tire went flat. He stopped at a service station to have it changed, but the spare tire wasn't fit for the speeds that he wanted to go. 
and he lost control of the vehicle going over 100 miles an hour. The crash was absolutely awful. He was thrown from the car and pulled away from the wreckage as it burst into flames by a truck driver that just happened to be passing by. He suffered a fractured skull, a busted eye socket, and was put into an induced coma for days. And the wreck was understandably the end of Gigi Lentini as one of the world's best wingers just a year after he became the world's most expensive transfer. And it wasn't just the initial injuries. He suffered suffered lasting effects. Now, every direction we went to research this talked about different lasting effects. And the truth is you wouldn't be able to know exactly what they are without talking to the guy himself. But different outlets reported everything from blurred vision at times to dizzy spells to short-term memory loss on occasion. AC Milan legend Marcel Desali said, you could see the skills, how he was before the accident and after the accident, the balance was completely different. But despite this incredible ordeal, he miraculously returned to AC Milan the following season. But in the following three seasons, he would go on to score just six goals. He did collect more winners medals, Serie A again, the Champions League, but he would show just very brief glimpses of that player that just a few years earlier had turned a world-class Inter Milan and a world-class Real Madrid inside out. But it is important to mention that to his credit, he has found his happiness and found his peace. Because in my opinion, the most telling part of his career is what happened after he left AC Milan. He followed his old coach Mondonico to Atalanta to play another season in Serie A where he was so good, a bit of a resurgence that he made it back into the Italian national team briefly. Then after that one season, not seeking any further glory, he went to Torino and got them promoted again to Serie A over the next couple years. But his passion for playing was still undiminished. He followed Mondonico again to Serie A B-side Cosenza and when asked why he he kept following Mondonico everywhere. He said, well, he's the only coach that could make him angry on a football pitch. He also seemed to be remarkably unbothered for a guy who a decade earlier had been beating the biggest clubs and best players in the world to be now playing in front of just 3,000 fans. Football was football, he said, regardless of where you played, and who it was against. After his fully professional days were over, he returned home to live a quiet life, but picked up and played with amateur teams, inviting his friends from earlier in his career to come join him and play together. He finally retired at the age of 42 in 2014, 20 years removed from taking Torino to the edge of glory and from the debates about his wasted talent and his remarkable feats. He settled instead into a quiet life in Carmagnola, playing billiards with his friends. Gianluigi Lentini was a relic of a bygone era. He was clearly brilliant. He played with childish disregard and reckless abandon, and he was caught up in a world that seemingly professionalized around him. But he just played because he loved playing. And he was, for a time, the most expensive player in the world because of forces entirely outside of his control. For what it's worth, when asked about the car crash and his career as a whole, he said, I was lucky to be alive. I was just so lucky to survive so many injuries. After it happened, I always wanted to do better when I played, but I'm still happy how my career turned out. This was honestly one of the most interesting research pieces we've ever done on this channel. The BBC article by Herbie Sykes is one of the best articles I have ever read, and it provides so much more color to this story. Check it out. These Football Times does a great job of describing Italy as a whole at that time as well, and every article, site, whatever that we use for research in this video is linked in the description. You can also save that for later and keep binge watching because this is the story of a goalkeeper that scored more goals than Zinedine Zidane. And they weren't all penalties, I promise.